I'm now joined by New York Times opinion writer and the author of Why We're Polarized, Ezra Klein. His new podcast, The Ezra Klein Show, launched this week. How you doing, man? I'm all right. How are you? I'm COVID good, is what I always say. COVID? Yeah, I'll take COVID good. I'm COVID good. Um, how's being a New York Times columnist? It's a trip. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> there, There's something very strange about writing a piece and then seeing that and your face at the New York Times, uh, it it imbues everything with an authority it probably doesn't deserve to have. I was talking to somebody, oh, and they're oh. like, your work is so much better now. And I was like, no, 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 my work isn't better. <laughs> the font, the font is just much more authoritative. This is the same work I've always been doing. No, now I read it now, and there's a lot more authority behind it. So I'm, Yeah, don't uh, I seem twice as old? Congratulations. You do, yeah. Well, we're all we're both old now. Um, so <laughs> you wrote a, you wrote a piece in the Times uh, last week that I think everyone should read, titled uh, "Democrats: Here's How to Lose in 2022 and Deserve It." And you know, your basic argument is that the biggest threat to democracy and the fastest path back to another Trump is ineffective, gridlocked government. Why do you think that is? So. This is something that did not get well hashed out in the great economic anxiety versus racism wars. But yeah. globally and historically, something that right wing populist authoritarian figures feed on is simply ineffective government, is a sense that the government does not work, not just on behalf of the people, but really at all. And one, uh, and Terry, uh, Moe and Howell have a great book on this. Uh, it's President's Populism and Something, but I, I quoted in the piece. But one of the points they make is simply take Donald Trump at his word. He came out and he said, I alone can fix it, right? All these people, they're making these terrible deals. I think something, a lot of liberals got Donald Trump mediated through liberal media, right? And so what they mostly got was the most outrageous and often racist parts of his uh, long rallies and everything. But if you went and listened to these whole hour, two hour riffs he did, a lot of it was about his claim to effectiveness, right? His claim yeah. as a businessman, as a guy who doesn't take shit from anybody to be able to cut the deals that the current politicians who are selling you out couldn't. So it is really, really important, one, that people understand that as part of how he rose to power, but two, that he did it in a context after the Obama years. You and me, we were there, you were doing it, I was covering in 2009, 2010, when a ton of legislation legislation happened under Obama and the Democratic Congress. But then there was six years, six years, where almost no legislative progress was made. Not literally none, but but almost none. And that does create uh, an inability to say to people credibly, if you are from that party, right, if you're Hillary Clinton running in 2016, elect me and things will change. We will make things happen differently. Um, it, it really deprives you of an ability to run as a change candidate again, because if it wasn't changing under your administration, why will it change under you? Well, and also, I mean, I've thought about this for a long, long time because this is part of the message that Obama ran on in 2008. Like the most compelling part of the argument, aside from, you know, it wasn't just bringing the country together for the sake of bringing the country together. It was bringing people together to sort of break the gridlock in Washington. And even in our polling, like the most potent part of the message was things aren't getting done in Washington. Washington is broken. And it is, whether it's been captured by lobbyists, whether it's, you know, partisanship, whatever it may be, nothing's coming out of D.C. And so it certainly wasn't for a lack of trying on our part <laughs> to try to get things done because we were very aware through both terms that, like, we were going to be judged and the sort of the stability of democracy depended on, at least that's what Obama believed, the stability of democracy depended on government actually delivering for people and making a tangible difference in their lives. But that is a very hard thing to accomplish in this political system. And in addition to that, one of the problems that Obama faced, and, and in a very real way, this is what I'm trying to write about, and the people I am trying to convince in this op-ed, we say the Democratic Party as if it is a singular entity. Like I'm sitting here talking into a microphone and a lamp, and they are like, they're one thing. I can like pick the microphone up and I can put it down. The Democratic Party is not one thing, um, particularly yeah. not in Congress, although not, and not in the country either. And a really important question in how it functions is what are the constraints imposed on it, and for that matter, on its president, uh, when it has a president, by the members who will cast the key hinge votes. So the Affordable Care Act is a different bill 
because Ben Nelson and Joe Lieberman and Mary Landrieu and a couple other Democratic, Democratic, importantly, members of the U.S. Senate insisted that it could not have a public option. It is a different and worse bill. It is a different bill because a bunch of so-called moderate members said it had to be under a trillion dollars. And so that led to this weird budget gimmick where it didn't start for four years because then its 10-year price tag would be under a trillion dollars. But that also meant the subsidies and the the, the help was a lot less than it otherwise could have been. So one of the, the, the key things here is that Democrats Democrats who are in these key seats who think that the way to get reelected is to make things smaller and make them slower and cut them up and make them more complex, they got wiped out for the most part in 2010. Um, There's still a couple people who fit that description around and we can talk about them. But one thing I'm really trying to push at these kinds of Democrats is this is a failed political theory. You have to come up with a different one. This idea that you will make everything a little bit worse, but you will survive the fact that nobody likes your party, that doesn't work in a world where there's a 94%, 94% correlation between how people vote for their Senate candidate and their presidential candidate. Well, the, the, the few Democrats in Congress who still believe that, like they are the whole problem right now. Like I was, I was trying to think about... A way to make this conversation uh, something other than like two filibuster haters convincing each other how right we are. Because <laughs> we've this both is, been this long- is a colloquy. You longer than me even. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and I realize that that is part of the larger, that's part of the problem of the larger debate over the filibuster. Like there's a lot of passionate choir preaching out there when it comes to the, the filibuster. And right now it seems like the only people that we really need to convince are Joe Manchin, Kirsten Cinema, and like, two or three other Senate Democrats. I mean, on on one hand, I do think that is progress because, you know, people who are just paying attention to politics today might not see that as progress. But like the fact that Chris Coons and Michael Bennett and all these other Senate Democrats, John Tester left the door open, right? Like all these Senate Democrats who you never would have thought would have given any, uh, you would have ever agreed to get rid of the filibuster are now at least open to it. But like, what do you, how do you convince Manchin, Cinema? whoever else there may be that's still uh that's still resistant to this if you're chuck schumer (laughs) well if if i if i if i knew they'd probably be convinced but let me me try to come at this from even a slightly different angle than the filibuster i always i'm trying to say three things in, in in this piece and with this line of argument but it doesn't begin with a filibuster process and the way systems work reflect the outcomes you want to get from them like that's, I think, a really important point. And something I'm always trying to say to people is that there is a way we think a democracy, for whatever its rules are, should work, which is that the public elects people um, based on their agendas. Those agendas get passed or some rough facsimile of them get passed. Then the public judges the results and then they can like throw the governing party out if they don't like them or, or bring them back if they do. And so just like on, on a first round question like, do people think that's how it should work instead of this weird way we do it now where the public votes for the agenda they then the people they like better? Those people may or may not take office depending on what happens in the Electoral College or House gerrymandering, yeah. whatever it is. Then those people probably can't govern even if they do take office. And then people fight about why nothing got done. So one, I, I just think it is important because I've watched this happen with Democrats before. I watched it happen through much of the Obama years. The Democrats take seriously the commitments they have made to the public as actual promises, that it is something that feels unacceptable to them to campaign to the public in a way that is lying to them, such that it will increase their disillusionment when the people they voted into office fail. If you run for office and you say, we all support a $15 minimum wage, and then you say, well, we all did except for those three people, and so now you don't get anything— People are going to be disillusioned. They will not believe in you in, yeah. in the future. And so that's one reason why in this particular piece, I, I did frame things around this question of depriving populist authoritarians like Donald Trump from, from getting power again. I think something that the mansions of the world, the cinemas of the world really do believe in is they are part of a project to protect liberal democracy. And, and something that, that Howell and Moe talk about is it a very common conceptual mistake that quote unquote, normal political figures make after defeating a would be authoritarian is because they see themselves as defenders of the system. They snap back to defending the very kinds of dysfunction and ineffectiveness 
that gave the authoritarian power in the first place. It is they, they leave being upset about the fact that the system doesn't work for you to authoritarians, thinking that somehow they need to be the opposite of, of the, the authoritarian in all in all ways. And it's really the opposite, that in the aftermath of like a like a near death for American democracy experience like Donald Trump, what you do is not revert to your pre-Donald Trump understanding of the status quo. What you need to do is is try to think about what led somebody like him to get power and knowing that the party that, by the way, in the House, a majority of them voted to overturn the election, the party that still reflects Trumpism and will reflect it only more in the years to come, they have this electoral advantage in the House, this huge electoral advantage in the Senate, in the Electoral College. And as such, you cannot let them quickly come back into power. They need to be defeated after this for some period of time. And the only way to do that, or at least one of the only ways to do that, is to actually do the things that you promised people would do when they chose you in a landslide margin over the other party. And if you don't, then you are opening the door back up. I know. It, it's The idea that the response to... Trump and what has happened to politics is that we've got to try harder to work together with the other side is so deeply ingrained, right? Like it's something that, you know, I've been yelling about for years, but like Manchin told the New York Times back in November, like, I don't know why anyone was surprised by what Manchin said this week uh, about not getting, wanting to get rid of the filibuster. Back in November, he did an interview with the Times uh, and he said that ending the filibuster would break the Senate, that the minority should have input or else the Senate would just become a glorified house. We've heard that argument before. And then he was specifically asked, well, what if there was a badly needed coronavirus stimulus package and Republicans won't make a deal? Would you at least make an exception for that? And he said, no, if we can't come together, God help us. Chuck Schumer can work with anyone. He'll be able to work with Mitch. Like, I don't, I, I assume that that is coming from a good faith place with Joe Manchin. Like, I think Gen Joe Manchin genuinely believes that. And I don't know how you disabuse him of that notion when it's not just like Manchin's coming up with that idea on his own. Like, that's also a lot of the mainstream media has that view. Like, the, the, the Times had an editorial today where they're like, don't sign so many executive orders joe biden like work with other people on stuff and i'm just like what how you guys know what's going on here you you witnessed the last four years like how, how i don't know how we sort of move past that f way of thinking so i think there are a couple things here you've probably seen this a lot over the years but but it was over time something i came to realize and that influences my thinking very very heavily the worst guides to the dynamics of congress are members of congress Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and that is because they experience everyone else in Congress as individuals. Mm -hmm. And as individuals, they seem really, really, really reasonable until they cast that vote at the end of the day. Uh, I have never covered like any major issue where at the beginning it didn't seem like you could get a, a lot of compromise. I mean, my God, like the Lucy and the football dynamics of the Affordable Care Act where, you know, right up until basically the end, Chuck Grassley was saying the individual mandate can get support Obama from both parties. Obama wrote about that in his book. Yeah, he it's, was just right It's so it. wild. And so, <laughs> but one thing that to take it very seriously is that one of the things that is that fools a guy like Joe Manchin and fools may be too, too strong a word here, but one way he experiences Congress differently than, than I do is he, is he spends a lot of time with his counterparts on the Republican side. And I spend some time with them. I'm a reporter. I talk to them. And everybody is more reasonable when they are talking to you than when they are voting. Like everybody. Yeah. And something that, I, that really, really parts me from, from Senator Manchin is I have come to the view that even if you believe it is really important to have uh, minority input on, on on bills, and I'm not sure I actually think it is important. Um, the way other systems work doesn't doesn't work that way. But nevertheless, let's say it is. The filibuster makes it worse. Um, the the core thing that people need to get about this is it the great myth in American governance is it bipartisanship, bipartisan input is something the minority wants and the majority has to be incentivized to offer, when it is precisely the reverse. Bipartisanship is something the majority wants, that the minority has to be heavily incentivized to offer because the majority is really helped by bipartisanship. If you can pass a bill and it's got a huge bipartisan backing, then you can run around the country and say, you're great at governing and you should be reelected. And then you get reelected and the majority, the minority loses even more seats. I mean, you're really asking them to act against interests, which by the way is why other systems don't work like this because it's a crazy way to set up incentives. But the minority is every incentive to sabotage the majority. So if they are 
they're going to play ball, like they need real incentives to do so. The filibuster is an incentive in the other direction. It gives them this capacity. You can imagine uh, uh, like a, like an incentive like list where number one is you want to get reelected and number two is you want to get the majority back. If you let them kill bills, it lets them uh, possibly get the majority back by sabotaging you. If they can't kill bills, at least to get reelected, maybe they need to show they're getting something done and participate on bills in order to get earmarks, pork, you know, things they need in the bills. Like at least it creates a constructive channel, but the filibuster creates a channel for them to get the majority back by simply killing everything. So it does not incentivize compromise. It incentivizes sabotage. I mean, Dan and I were just talking about this before we started this interview, like, we they just Rand Paul forced a vote where they could only get five Republican senators to say that a trial was constitutional for the guy who incited a mob that almost killed them and their colleagues. <laughs> and yet we think we're going to pick off 10 of them <laughs> to work on a covid relief plan. Like, I don't. <laughs> and here's the thing, like I, you were saying this earlier, like I, I hate saying like Democrats have to be better about this or Democrats have to do this because you think Democrats and it's like we've actually come a long way. Like the Biden White House is probably more despite all of his rhetoric on unity and bipartisanship. I think the Biden White House as a whole is more clear eyed about this than we were in the Obama White House because they learned the lessons that we did. I think that our caucus is far more progressive and far more clear eyed than it's ever been in the Senate. And of course, I think the House is in a great place, too. So we've actually made huge strides. But like the real fear I have is, is one that you voice, which is like if if the entire agenda is held up because Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema decide not to uh eliminate the filibuster like voters aren't going to get that it's their fault voters are going to say like fuck the democrats just didn't do anything again and they didn't pass anything and they didn't improve my life and so yeah maybe i'll take a listen to the next populace yeah i i think that's exactly right and by the way i will say that i think mansion and cinema are out there taking some heat for others who want to be quieter but but we're both in california the senior senator from california oh, Diane yeah. feinstein, I forget feinstein. Yeah, ha- has also yeah. come out this way which i think is an embarrassment frankly Look, how many uh, more, of, how many more do you think there are besides Feinstein? I think the question is not is it's always hard to tell where people's bottom lines are if they would fold under pressure. That that is where I think the Democratic Party, as you say, moving dramatically on this issue matters because pressure can get people to do things they wouldn't otherwise want to do or that's not their first choice in doing it. Um, a lot of the people we've talked about, they've been persuaded over time. This is not where they started. Michael Bennett was a huge opponent of doing anything on the filibuster yeah. for many, many, many years, and I think he's moved a lot on that issue. So have so have a bunch of them. The Democratic Party, though, has everything you say about it. It has to start from the simple fact that the Democratic Party is behind the eight ball in American politics. In the Senate, there is a six to seven point advantage for Republicans because the kind of median Senate state is six to seven points to the right of the median voter. So Democrats have to win these huge landslides, the 50-50 majority, I'm sorry, the 50-50 split in the Senate right now. The 50 Democrats represent 41 million people, 41 million more than the 50 Republicans, 41 million Um, in the House. The number is not that big, but but it's quite large. Uh, And then obviously the Electoral College could have flipped with a shift of 40,000 votes, even as Joe Biden won by 7 million votes. So the Democratic Party is in a way that is historically unprecedented, really, really disadvantaged by the way American politics weights geography. So then the problem is that the like the hinge senator, your mansions, your cinemas, etc., if Democrats had power in relationship to their votes, Joe Manchin would be, you know, I'm, I'm just pulling this number a little bit out of the air, but like, let's call it like, you know, there would be eight. Democrats to Joe Manchin's left, right? He would not be the last one. Or I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I said that wrong. But but you know what I mean? Joe Manchin would not be the last Democrat. There would be eight Democrats there who could be that 51st vote. Right. And the issue right now is Joe Manchin. And I do want to say I, I give him credit on this. Joe Manchin is doing something incredibly difficult in American politics, which almost no one is able to do, which is remaining a Democrat from an extraordinarily red state. There are very few of those people out there right now, and the Democratic majority would not exist without Joe Manchin. So he, he has some by, idea. He only won by three points in 2018 yeah. after winning by a lot more than that in the last several years. Like he, you know, I, I don't know that Joe, my, Joe Manchin gets elected again in 2024 from West Virginia, and I think he probably knows that. Yeah. And so when I think about him, I I think of two things. One is that I do still think it is more likely he gets elected uh, if 
Democrats are seen as governing well rather than poorly. Not like nobody cares about whether or not the filibuster exists. Um, and then number two, you know, and then look, even if you didn't get reelected, at least you did something, right? I mean, some some right. political scientists, and I love my political scientists to come back at me and said, well, you know, like it actually isn't always true that passing good policy is good politics. And and I know, like I've I've like I've I've, I've read the policy feedback literature too. But you know what? If you do it and you get like you get knocked out of office or you don't get the majority back next time, at least you helped a lot of people rather than losing and not helping a lot of people. That would look that that was Obama's thought when it looked like the ACA was going to die. And and Rom and everyone was like, you're going to lose in 2012 if you keep pushing this monstrous bill and it's going to be bad and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, if I lose, I lose. Like then, like I promised, I would try to do healthcare, and that, and I'm not gonna like put my approval rating up on a shelf and admire it. Like I'm just gonna do it, which is also partly why I thought to myself, like Joe Manchin's got to look at this seat and got to think about 2024 and think, like, am I really gonna win again in West Virginia? Like, why don't I just help? Like, you can tell the guy genuinely wants to help people in West Virginia from what he's saying, unless he's just yeah. a really good liar. But like, I believe that he does. Um, you know, people like cinema, I, I sort of wonder a li- even a little bit more because I'm like, she's in a pretty competitive state that is turning bluer. I don't quite know where her resistance is coming from. But like, let's say Manchin and cinema don't budge for a while, but we still have a White House, a House, and most of a Senate that want to do a lot to help people fast in these next two years. What does that look like to you? And do you think, do you think it could be enough to sort of avoid a disaster in 2022? Let me come back to the disaster in 2022 question because that's actually harder than the first part so the first thing to say here is that budget reconciliation is going to be everything um and um, you guys have talked about this on the show but the very quick version is budget reconciliation is this weird process from the 1974 budget act which created a fast track approval process to reconcile budgets between the house and the senate then somebody realized you could just put anything in that process um and that would get around the filibuster but you can only use it once a year there's some there's some static around that, but I think that's basically right. So then the Senate did this new thing. They, they, they created a set of constraints on it called the bird rule. So anything goes through budget reconciliation, it's got to be mainly about taxing and spending. Um, and it can't uh, increase deficits outside of 10 years. Okay. And it can't touch social security. So one is that you can do quite a lot there on economics. So a lot of other things you can't. So one of my big concerns is I think democracy promotion and democracy deepening is really important. House yeah. Democrats have HR1, Democrats have SR1, the For the People Act. It's a great bill. It cannot go through budget reconciliation. It will be filibustered immediately. So that's one thing you can't do. But you can, say, do checks through budget reconciliation. You could expand the child tax credit through budget reconciliation. You could do great things on health care through budget reconciliation. But the other thing you could do if your mansions and cinemas don't want to vote to get rid of the filibuster, but do want to actually get things done. The way budget reconciliation works is you do something and then let's say that it doesn't fit, right? It's not about taxing and spending. So somebody raises a point of order and then the parliamentarian rules and advises a vice president and like, okay, like that's, that's the end of that. You could vote to overrule the point of order. Right? right. You could just vote to say, nope, we actually think this fits in budget reconciliation. And what the Republicans are going to run on? This was abusive of the budget reconciliation process in a way us putting and we're drilling and tax cuts. What? Like nobody cares. So one thing you could do is use budget reconciliation and expand its boundaries. This is, I should say, Bernie Sanders very explicit plan. It's what he talked about in, in the campaign. Yeah. Well, He's so talked I, about I, it I remember, since and it's a good I, idea. I remember I remember interviewing him about the filibuster and feeling I was I, I didn't understand why Bernie of all people was so for keeping the filibuster, but he had this whole budget reconciliation overrule the parliamentarian plan that that sounds very complex, but really isn't. Like you said, like the way this works is all right, fifteen dollar minimum wage. Does it affect the budget or not? Let's try. Let's throw it in with the rest of the COVID relief bill. Someone raises a point of order. Parliamentarian says no, it doesn't fit. Kamala Harris says yeah, it does, and then that's that. Then it goes in. <laughs> And then there's got to be a vote because they can they can do the thing. But if Democrats are willing to vote for it, they could do quite a lot through there. And as weird as it sounds, like I want to like if you are a listener and you're like John and Ezra sound like they're explaining something completely ludicrous. Like this is a crazy way for something to work. Like you are right. Like if you feel like you have gotten drunk and left Earth, like that is correct. <laughs> this is not the way you should run a government. Like I really do not like any of these outcomes. But the Senate does stuff like this all the time. I mean, budget reconciliation being used in any way the way it is now 
is this, right? This is not budget reconciliation is not for any of this, but the Republicans do it, the Democrats do it. So Senate has a tendency to not solve problems directly, but instead to come up with unbelievably complex ways of, of like working around them sometimes indirectly. So this would be really fitting. It's um, I, I always say like gridlock, you're in LA. I would say like gridlock is a very apt metaphor because when things get gridlocked, it's not that like nobody goes anywhere. You start taking really weird side street, like shortcuts that are not shortcuts and that are very inefficient and use up a lot of gas. And like, that's the way we legislate now. Like it's gridlock. Right. So we do all this weird stuff on side streets, but it's better than not doing anything at all. Um, I do want to make one other just quick point though on policy construction, because it's not just that they need to get rid of the filibuster, but, and I know how much you want to talk about this, but they need the stuff they do to be simple and to help people fast before 2022. That's part of not having a disaster. You mean, in you mean like not giving, you mean like not giving people tax cuts and having them show up by like changing the withholding <laughs> tables and your checks yes. like we did in the recovery act. Yeah. Exactly. So make, make no, and work pay was designed <laughs> to be invisible, right? Don't do that. Checks are a great, checks are a great example here. Um, you can do a lot on healthcare that happens really quickly. Obama Obamacare did actually, the, the political theory behind it that it would eventually become popular was true, but it took a long time because the bill took a long time to give benefits. Do things that are quick, that people feel, and that they can trace back to government for a very, I think this is a super important point that people underplay. For a very long time, in order to get bipartisan support, Democrats have preferred doing private public hybrid options where the government is doing something, but in a way that it looks like the private sector is doing it, like the government is spending money to get people health insurance, but it's being done in this complicated way through private insurance systems. Do not do that. You cannot, you cannot govern in the way meant to get Republican support if you cannot get Republican support, because then you're just getting really bad things into your bill that are complex and make people not like the government and make it hard for things to be used. Um, but you're also not getting the bipartisan cover. So then Chuck Grassley turns around and says, your individual mandate is unconstitutional. And now you've got Chuck Grassley's program and Chuck Grassley's criticisms. Like, don't do that. Be simple, fast, big. Yeah. And look, is it is it going too far for Donald Trump to like sign the checks? <laughs> <laughs> the stimulus checks. Yes, of course. But honestly, like that's the kind like you do I I do think Democrats forget once we're governing to like sufficiently advertise that the benefits we deliver are coming from the leadership in charge. Like every time I would drive around in 2010, 11 and see a construction project and there was like a little recovery act thing on it. Like should have been like a big picture of Barack Obama or something when a road is finished or a bridge is finished, <laughs> you know? Like I do think that they, they need to Democrats need to spend more time connecting the dots for people because people don't don't see government in their lives often. No, they don't. And and one, just rebuilding that is important. And I will say something that I think is important and makes this a very different period than 2009 to 2010 is the Biden administration has the ability to more directly make a government operation part of people's lives and uh, a massive improvement in lives through the vaccine program, through the vaccine rollout, than any in, any administration yes. since a major war, right? I mean, that they could have FEMA and National Guard operations operating everywhere doing 24-7 vaccination sites. And at the end of that, you can hug your family again, right? I mean, nobody comes into office with this kind of ability to, to use the power of the government to actually make lives better. So that's going to be something they can do without that much congressional help and how they do it is, is really going to matter. But yes, you need to rebuild the connection between, between people and the government. Look, we're talking a lot about the Democratic Party, but I will just say that I one reason this is important is American politics is not going to function without a more sensible and, and real Republican Party. And one way you push the Republican Party into some level of reform is is Democrats have to compete against it harder. They they have a handicap against them. It's really, really hard. But they cannot give the Republican Party inches it has not earned. And creating complex, slow-moving programs where people do not feel the government moves in their lives quickly and is helpful, it allows Republicans conti to continue demonizing the government, right? Like, you go back to, like, the old Bill Clinton, the era of big government is over. Somebody was tweeting yeah. the other day that the era of the era of big government is over, is over. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, this is a moment, like, people are really seeing Thing, it is scary when the government cannot help you and you need it. Like Joe Biden comes into office at a time that is unlike any since the New Deal, World War II, you know, maybe a couple other small exceptions um, where he can make clear that the government is there to help you when you need it and you need them there when you need it. And like, that's a pretty big opportunity. It's a big opportunity. And 
just to close it all out, it might be the last opportunity, <laughs> partly because <laughs> the way the House map is, the Senate map, the Electoral College uh, getting worse, like all of this stuff is getting to a point where I actually do believe that if we don't use the opportunity we have now in these next two years or four years, um, we might find ourselves governing in a minority or at least operating in a political system that gives an undue advantage to the minority, um, a, minor a party that's governing to minority um, for many, many years to come, which is a problem. This is 100 percent true. This is also I will. I know I'm just going back to preaching the choir on the filibuster here, but this is why democracy reform is important. Uh, it just is. Um, Democrats are in a position where if they just let the current trends take over, it doesn't it, like they are going to be asked to win by such unrealistic margins. They're going to be like either semi permanently in the minority or they're going to permit a Republican Party, which is true for Trump's Republican Party, that could never compete for majority of the public to win with an ethno-nationalist appeal to a minority of the public. And that's a really dangerous place to be in. Whereas if you get rid of the filibuster or you create some other pathway and you pass things like HR1 and SR1, you give statehood to DC, which it richly deserves because that is the right thing to do, not because it is a power grab. You at least offer statehood to Puerto Rico, give them self-determination. Uh, maybe they choose it, maybe they don't. But you can do a lot to create a fair playing field. And you know what? Like This seems like the, like the most obvious thing to say, but for the party with democracy basically in its name, democracy is a good system and making sure we live in one is a worthwhile and principled political goal. I this I mean I've been saying this since like I, right after John Lewis died thinking like, you know, every, rename it the John Lewis uh John Lewis Civil Rights Act and let McConnell let the Republicans filibuster that. Let that be the one that they filibuster, make them go to the floor, filibuster the John Lewis voting rights bill they, or, or democracy reform. We'll put all these different democracy reforms in the bill. And H.R. 1 now is sort of beefed up from what it was. And make that be the one that we break the, break the filibuster on. Because like that, it's probably, you probably get the, get the most emotional punch from that. And it probably will be the easiest for people to understand that they're actually filibustering a desire to make voting easier. <laughs> Yeah, and to get money out of politics and to do a bunch of things. Yep. It isn't even that any of these ideas would fix all the problems. Like if you added D.C. and Puerto Rico as states, the Senate would still have a big pro-Republican bias. Like it would still be not not, a, yeah. not an even fight over there, but it would matter. And so this is like the, maybe in the end analysis, like what I would say to the mansions and the cinemas of the world, like they are consigning themselves to the minority in the future. They're consigning the voters who have put their faith in them, like who have put their faith in them to make their lives better to not having that trust returned. Um, right. I understand for how long politicians have operated putting first the aesthetics and performance of a small d democratic political system before the actual work and conflict necessary to get it. But to those who prefer like the decorum of a political system to actual democracy, like I don't think that is a moral standpoint. And I don't think it is how... Senator, Sin I don't think it is how Senator Cinema or Senator Manchin like think of themselves, but it is what they are doing. Right. Like they are consigning the voters who trusted them to powerlessness or to a system that is not going to represent them unnecessarily. Um, there is no, yeah. there is no reason for this, and there is no defense of it. Well, I'm sure they're listening to this, and we just <laughs> so mission accomplished. Uh, Ezra Klein from the New York Times, thank you so much for joining. Uh, everyone, check out Ezra's podcast, The Ezra Klein Show, launched with the New York Times this week, and uh, and pick up uh, pick up his book, Why We're Polarized. Outstanding book. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining. Thank you. Always a pleasure.